Some psychics go so far as to offer help to the police. In order to see how useful this is, we prepared an experiment using this collection of instruments which might have been used to commit crimes. And then again, they might not. Is it possible for a psychic to read the history of an instrument just by touching? My final guest claims to be able to do this. Now, Nella, you regularly approach the police with information you believe you have about crimes. The test you and I have agreed upon involves a number of objects which you've never seen before. We're going to see what information you can get from them. Any or all of these could have been connected with a serious crime involving a loss of life. The history of each object is known. Which ones uh, do you think are most likely? That's just a little thing. That's just a... I think. Could have been quite innocent, but getting into a lock of some sort. I felt glass with that one, as if it could have been used to... <coughs> I feel glass. Not doing bad, are we? <laughs> this one, God knows why. I'm picking up... a heavy tyre, a heavy vehicle tyre. So I don't know what that's been used for. Sorry, my darling, best I can do. Let's look at your results. I know you make no claims for accuracy, but it's still interesting that you examined six objects, you got no information from three of them, and you got incorrect information from the remaining three. I wonder what the police would make of that. I'm just trying to explain all that I do by logic. Oh, no. What I do is illogical. It's been a most intriguing demonstration, and we'd like to thank you very much, Nella, for taking part. Good evening, everybody. I hope to be able to make a link with someone here tonight and bring a loved one through from the world of spirit. Now, someone here tonight either is Mr. Taylor or the name of Taylor will have a close connection with you. Uh, my mother's maiden name is Taylor. Because, yeah. you see, I have a gentleman here who links with that name very clearly and uh, he would have been quite elderly when he passed. I feel he's your granddad. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And who's, who's Jimmy? Do you know who Jimmy is? Can't, can't picture oh, Jimmy. James. Hang on a minute. Do you know who Doris is? No, I can't picture that either. <laughs> okay. Well, I want us to look carefully at the connections that you say you made. Let's take a vote. First, how many people in our audience tonight can connect with the name Taylor? About 30%. And now, how many people can relate to the condition of the grandfather? Hmm, about 55%. So to sum up, about a third connect with the name Taylor and over half connect with the details of the grandfather. Well, that's very interesting. Maureen's statements seem to be more general than each of you thought before we took the vote. Make of that what you will. Is this a picture of a dear departed soul? We begin our quest with a lady who sketches what she believes to be portraits of spirit people. And these are examples of her work. Could you tell us now what person in the audience might be able to identify with the spirit picture that you're going to produce? No, we don't understand quite how this works, but we have to make the link with the spirit and then hope that it will make sense to somebody in the audience. I see. Well, I'm going to back off the set now and just let you do your thing. I will try to draw someone from the world of spirit. Stephen will tune in to the same spirit. And if what we're getting makes sense to one of you, will you please answer, put your hand up. Obviously got a lady coming through a lady who makes me feel terribly, terribly short of breath. She, she would have suffered either with heart trouble or possibly even have passed with a chest condition. Have you got any contact with her, Stephen? I wonder if there's anybody in our audience that either holds the surname of Butler or knows that name well, please. Do we have anybody there? Do we get a voice? Are you Butler? I am, yes. That is your name? Yes. Who is William Butler that's calling in from the other side of life? Someone that was known as Will, William, passed over quite a while back, I've got to say. I don't know if you've heard of that name, have you? William Butler? Uh, sorry. Don't make it fit, whatever no. you do. Hello, sir, there. Is this making sense to you of a lady that passed in the way I described, possible heart condition angina, 
I feel she went silently, quietly in her sleep. I know a man called William Butler. Good. Whose wife passed away with angina. Yes. But I've got to say that that picture doesn't look like... The picture doesn't fit with her. That's fine. No. As long as the details are right, we may be able to, to piece it together if we can. We're working under very difficult uh, circumstances here. We're trying our best. Can you um, Come on, sort yourself out. We'll try and place the face. What we normally do is try to link through and get the name of the communicator, but we can't demand that. But if you take this back to that connection, you will find you said a photograph, Coral, of this lady, and it's something to do with the bombing. So I would like to say to you, the audience, and the television station, to, to follow you back and have a look and see if you can place her. At least try that. I certainly will, yeah. Would you do that? Will do, Thank yeah. you very much Thank indeed. You. Now, Carl said that the face she has drawn should mean something to somebody in our audience. Is there anybody here who can relate to this picture? Please vote if you think you recognize the face. Well, ten people say they recognize this face, which is odd since you said, Carl, that only one person should relate to it. Perhaps this drawing is not as specific as you think? Well, thank you very much anyway, Carl and Stephen. Um... What I want to try to prove is that thoughts can be transmitted um, from one person to another. And detected by this machine. And it's detected by this machine. I see. And it's connected to your colleague, Mr. Ron Turner. Are you connected, Ron? I am, thank you. I'm glad to know a man who feels well connected. Norman, would you please tune the machine for us now? Surely. And I understand that this also involves your wife, Norma, who is in our audience. And I understand that Norma is going to send pleasant thoughts over to Ron and that the machine will pick up the thoughts as Ron receives them. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. But I would say at this point, it's not pleasant thoughts, it's healing thoughts. Ah, I see. All right, I stand corrected. Now, Ron, how can we tell when you are receiving Norma's thoughts? How will that be evident? Uh, it'll be evident because the dial will show a rise and also there will be a rise in the sound. I'll signal you like this. Okay, that's the official signal. And you will signal Norma to start sending thoughts. Okay, Norman? That's quite all right. Now. And stop. Very good. Of course, it's possible that this happens through visual interaction between Ron and Norma. And in order to avoid such an accusation, we're going to see Ron facing in the opposite direction. Ron, would you swivel around, please? And now I'll signal when Norma is to start sending her thoughts. I will give the same signal. Count about seven. Sometime within the next few seconds or so. And under these conditions, we'll see what happens, all right? All right, stop. Now let's give it a second try, if you will. Sometime in the next few seconds or so, I will give the signal by holding my thumb up. She's already started. I can't stop it. <laughs> I guess we're having a hard time stopping it, Norman, or can you readjust it? To... No, no, no. Uh, the, the, he's received it, you see, and it's in his energy form now. Norma, will you stop? <laughs> All right, sometime in the next little while, I'm going to give another signal. It's beginning to slow. No, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, Norma, would you stop the signal, please? Well, under these conditions, there doesn't seem to be a correlation that I can see. Perhaps Norma failed once and perhaps succeeded once, but I think it's very hard to tell. Uh, sending thoughts with the box reacting, maybe it's been shown and maybe it hasn't. I can't make up my mind. Perhaps Ron was reacting to a visual signal rather than thought messages in the first part of the demonstration. I, nevertheless, the box is very interesting. Norman, would you allow electrical engineer to take a look inside that box? Most certainly not. Well, that's I'd a pity. I would rather get it patented first. 
Well, that's a pity. I'm sure our audience would like to know what's going on in there. However, I would like to thank all three of you. Norma, Ron Turner, Norman Knight. Earlier in the day, we gave you five examples of handwriting, each one from a different career, a career that you have designated as being suitable for this experiment. Well, we have a saleswoman, computer training officer, an artist, a secretary and a farmer, and these five ladies are with us in the studio tonight. So I understand that on the basis of graphological analysis, you've tried to allocate each sample to its author. Right. Now, the expected result by chance uh, would be to get one out of the five correct, by chance alone, and there's a less than 1% chance of your getting all five correct. Let's start with sample A. I had a tussle whether it was the, the computer or the saleswoman, and I went for the saleswoman. Thank you very much. Will Lady A please go to the sales ladies section? Now, what about number B here? Now, put her uh, as computers. So you placed Lady B in the computer profession? I did. I'm going to ask Lady B to step over behind the computer. All right, and what about C? Uh, she uh, has opened the clouds a bit. She does a lot of thinking. And I'm going to say something particularly definite here, and she can tell me what's right or whether it's wrong. Do you have a scar in your abdomen? Wrong. No, you don't. No scar in the you abdomen. Don't. What uh, profession did you allocate this Well, I allocated her between the, um, the, the land, between the land and, in fact, the sales. You chose yeah, this sorry, lady? Sorry, I chose the land, that's right. All right, this lady will step around to where we find the tractor down in the end there, please. And what about San, uh, sample D? There is a lightness and uh, uh, delicacy to the handwriting. So okay, this lady right. is the artist in that's your right. estimation. That's Very right. well, would you step over behind the palette and the brushes, please? And um, finally, I think I can guess which one this is. Would you step over behind the typewriter, please? Because you apparently are supposed to be the secretary. Well... I'm going to ask each one of these ladies in turn, first of all, number one, are you indeed a salesman? Vote with yes or no. You are not a salesperson. And number two, are you a computer expert? You are not. Number three, are you the artist? Ah, you are. And number four, are you that secretary we're looking for? Apparently not. And number five, are you a farmer? I see. Well... Would you please move to the correct positions that you belong in, the four ladies that were not correct? Would you move to the correct positions? Now we know who is really in that profession. We expected that according to chance, Duncan, you would get one correct, and you got exactly one correct. My first guest is an astrologer whose work is read by millions of people in Britain every day. Jonathan has kindly agreed to put his talents to the test this evening. And before the show, we gave you the details of one person selected from that audience. So please give us your reading for that person. Okay. Well, I don't know who I'm addressing here, but I know that the person who owns the horoscope that I've been looking at has a very unusual horoscope. This horoscope is unusual, and it suggests to me that you are a very extrovert person, unusual, larger than life, full of confidence, um, with a very zany sense of humor, and generally a kind of way of being different, eccentric, controversial. You will kind of enjoy the limelight that comes from uh, when it's revealed that it's you. You won't feel too shy or ashamed of it. And one more thing I should also say, there's something about you which is rather professorial and intellectual, and it makes me think that we're dealing with someone who's um, had a, a, a well-trained mind, is very speedy and alert and quick-witted. So we're looking for someone who's controversial and professorial. Now, let's see if uh, he or she agrees. But first, let's see by a show of hands in the audience here, how many people in the audience think this reading sounds like theirs? Let's see a show of hands. Well, we've got, what, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, about 15, maybe a few more. Quite a few, actually. Now, let's meet our real subject of that reading. Uh, please welcome Hugh Laurie. So tell us, Hugh, uh, what did you make of that reading? Is there anything, is it anything like you? I mean, does it apply to you? Uh, I wouldn't say very much, no. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly not enjoying the limelight now. Um, well, you may say, why did I come up? Well, curiosity, you know, but um, limelight, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say no. Uh, extrovert, I don't think so. 
professorial. I got the lowest possible degree at the university I went to. Ah, but you did go to university. Oh, that's right. Well, that's a start. Oh, that's yeah. a, <laughs> one for me. Do you think you count that as one for you, do you? Oh, well, it's a small well, you, one you're for very me, generous I think, yeah. I call that a draw, yeah, all right. Um, uh, what else was there? Did uh, I say you had a good sense of humour? I think I did. Hands up in this audience who thinks they have not got a sense of humour. <laughs> Oh, there you go. It would have been a brilliant one of me. Instantly. That's the odd thing. Uh, people do regard me as prof professor, uh, professorial in some way or another. Uh, Hugh isn't at all. Uh, he's certainly not extrovert. And stupid. Stupid, <laughs> stupid, in fact. I wouldn't have get together, but not in the least bit stupid. Very intelligent, but not in a professorial or academic kind of way. Uh, and certainly not competent. In fact, I, I seem to spend uh, a good 90% of my life trying to make you more competent. He gets nervous and he, he despises it. I think it. you do your friend a grave injustice. I've looked at his horoscope and I'm sure he's capable of far more than that. Yeah, but I've looked at him, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jonathan, it doesn't seem that uh, Hugh and Stephen are entirely convinced by your reading. And even more interesting, many people in our audience tonight thought that it could be them as well. What explanation could there be for that, do you think? No, what we're testing here is my ability to communicate. And, of course, you must understand in the newspapers, I specialize in saying things that do apply to a lot of people at once. Well, from my experience, readings in newspapers are very general, and perhaps that's why in America some of them now carry a health warning, which makes it clear they're for entertainment purposes only. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for taking part. In our admittedly small number of trials, none of the special skills or powers seem to have been demonstrated. The question remains. Do these abilities really exist? Ladies and gentlemen, we give you the evidence. You make up your own minds. I'm James Randi. Good night. <laughs>